it has been so much fun and so, I don't know, joyous watching all of my medicinal plant friends popping up in my garden from the elecampane to the comfrey and the arnica. I love seeing these friends pop up. And if you are still trying to decide what to grow in your medicinal herb garden, you've got to grab my guide. It's all about the most essential herbs that every mom should know and should grow. So I teach you how to grow them and the many different ways that you can use them. If you want to grab the guide, go ahead. It's free and I'm pretty sure you're going to get a lot of delight and use out of it. And there's a link to it in the show notes. I'm wishing you tons of happy medicine planting. Hello and welcome to The Herbalist Path, a podcast where you'll discover how to make your own herbal remedies at home so that you can take better care of yourself, better care of your family, and better care of our planet. I'm Mel. I'm a clinical herbalist, environmental educator, and mountain living mama with this crazy passion for teaching more mamas and their little loves how to use plants as medicine in a safe, effective, and tasty way so that there can be an herbalist in every home again. It's an absolute honor to have you on the journey down the herbalist path with me so that together we can make herbalism Hashtag spread like wildflowers. Welcome back to another episode of The Herbalist Path. I am really excited and really honored for today's guest. It's Dr. Tori Hudson. She is a naturopathic physician and also a professor at the National University of Naturopathic Medicine, Bastyr University, also Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. She is absolutely brilliant and has been working in the field of integrative women's health for well over 35 years right now. She is also the formulator and creator of Vitanica and the education director there, which is a wonderful herbal products company. And she's also the author of the Women's Encyclopedia of Natural Medicine. She is brilliant. <laughs> Victoria, I've, been, I've been following your work for a long time and doing my own research based off of your research. So thank you very much. And I'm honored that you're taking the time to come chat on the Herbalist Path. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mel. Thanks for having me. And uh, we're up to 40 years now, actually. And uh, so getting older as as the day goes on. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm I'm 45. So when I hear that, I'm like, this is fascinating. And I'm at that age, you well know, at that age where I'm like, oh, I'm almost becoming wise now. Like I know enough that I know I need to know a lot more. And yeah, so fantastic. 40 years. So I would love to hear 40 years ago, these kinds of things were certainly not at the forefront of mainstream media like it is right now. And I would you know, just... I, uh, I graduated from um, naturopathic medical school in, in 84, but I was uh, very... Uh, and I graduated from high school, just to give you some context, in 1970. So 1970, uh, and in the 70s, there was a, a whole lot of things happening uh, politically, and people kind of, there's the back to the land movement, uh, hippies, self-sustainability, um, the self-help, women's you know, doing your own speculum, self speculum exams. Uh, the first Earth Day, I think, was in 1970. So all of those had quite a bit of convergence into that, you know, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old time period. Um, and um, I, uh, yeah, I quickly, I mean, I did start college after high school, but uh, I, after a couple, after a couple of years, I stopped and took a little side route that led me back to this uh career and but there there was a time there I, yeah i lived off grid and that was where i really kind of got into herbal medicine and roamed the foothills of the cascades of southern oregon and uh picked and dried and prepared and was sort of the 
uh, local um, self uh, identified herbalist and you know was was eager to you know offer my thoughts and ideas and herbs to people who were interested but that was uh yeah that was uh, quite a while ago and herbal medicine was definitely i mean herbal medicine has been around for you know generations as you know uh, but during that period of the 70s it was kind of really in the united states and anyway, i kind of parked in the i would say the hippie alternative lifestyle crowd with some of the but there were some old timers you know Dr. John Christopher and uh, other el teachers who were sort of the herbal elders of that era. That wow. then, um, then I think the uh, and in out of that time period, some of the more well-known herbalists, Rosemary Gladstar and Cascade Anderson, those were the ones that were most in my world. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, who else? Michael Tiara. David Winston, some of those names of people that were starting to, you know, really spread herbal education. Mm -hmm. And there are others I just don't, you know, can't list them all right now. Yeah, it gets challenging to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but they, you know, they were influenced me even before I went back to medical school and naturopathic medicine. Mm -hmm. um, I was not eager to read books and take classes that were in those days kind of taught, you know, in the woods or, you know, taught, taught, a, taught a, in a, not, not in regular classroom situations. Uh, and that's where I kind of honed some of my early skills. I love that. I can imagine you frolicking through the Cascades. It was <laughs> the Cascades that got me into herbalism as well, because I was a backpacking guide. And I'm like, what's all this toxic crap in everybody's backpacks and, and first aid kits? And then I'm like, but wait, what are these plants and what are they doing? Yeah, and yeah. that just kind of paved the path. And so did people of your generation, thankfully. Um, it's been a really wonderful and forever learning journey. I think that's one of the beautiful things about it. So I'm curious of young Tori in <laughs> 1970, 71, all the way through that whole window of post high school and frolicking through those mountains and woods that we are so lucky to be around. I'm curious what herbs really made you just go, wow, hmm. I need to, I need to know more, you know, specifically. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I know you sent me that question ahead of time and I had a hard time <laughs> thinking of the answer because my first thought was actually it started before then in my childhood, I would say. Yeah. This, I was like, a, for some reason, I was like glued in on blackberries and blackberry picking, which is a, you know, has sort of fairly pedestrian, you know, uses, but, but it, I think I was just really drawn to the fact like, it's free. It's everywhere. It's in my backyard. I can go pick these berries. I can smell them. I can make things out of them, but, and then, and there's many more medicinal aspects to it that I've learned since then. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say in the seventies, uh, what might have really, well, there was, there was many wild plants uh, and, uh, some unusual ones, uh, you know, Devil's Club, and well, maybe not so unusual, but um, you know, of course, a lot of um, medicinal trees, uh, which a lot of people don't often talk about. Right. Um, and uh, what else was growing out there in those mountains and those foothills? I, I remember the Devil's Club. I think a wild. Wild coat, cold sweat, probably uh, his setup, mm -hmm. nettles. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that any one plant just said aha to me, but just the idea. And I had this little funky little cabin. I picked things and dried things and hung things. And um, so and, uh, this was sort of surrounded by, by all that. And I was very drawn to it. And it fit in with the lifestyle of the time and the, my sort of ethics of the time. Uh, rose hips also were early on for me and uh, simple things, you know, simple yeah. things. 
Um, and rose hips to this day, I love going in the fall, just walk out my door, walk up the path, up the trails here and pick uh, wild rose hips and uh, elderberry leaves that grow in the forest park. And, and I just kind of just that little ritual that I love. I like the seasonal rituals, the blackberries in the summer and the rose hips in the fall and the nettles in the early spring. You know, I, I, I sort of like those simple local herbs that I can just easily access and easily um, uh, preserve and store. And, and you don't have to, it's not complex to use them. Um, right. I really li like that. Now that's a far cry from sort of Vitanica and formulations and oh, yeah. complexities of blends and things. But but I think it's a really good reminder for people just to start in simple things that you can yeah. easily, where I live, you can, I can grow different mints. I can grow lemon balm. I can grow yarrow. I can grow digitalis almost like springs up wherever I look where, on my property. And, you know, just, yeah. I mean, that's a little dicier herb, but. <laughs> I'm like that's not one we're going to talk about no, too much today. No. But you know the the lemon balm, the nettles, the mint, the the just yeah. wonderfully simple things. And I I'm not I can't remember how much uh, what elevation, but Oregon grape root also just oh, right outside my, my whole backyard is just easy covered. Uh, I have a lot of burdock around here as well. Yeah, um, growing wild. So much great free medicine. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's great free medicine that is fairly minimal effort to actually, you know, gather and, and prepare. Yeah, the the downfall, and this is a, a great credit to Vitanica and your tasty tonics, particularly. The downfall to some of that free medicine is it can be really gross, but your tasty tonics <laughs> are actually really tasty. And I I ran a little herbal product line for about thirteen years. It was I called Mountain Melt. Yeah. Did you see that? Did you ever see it in the stores? I, like new well, seasons? I don't or? recall seeing it, but when I was looking at your website, I, I was reminded of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of my focuses was making herbal remedies so they're palatable so people want to make them as a part of their life right yeah. and i look at all of the formulas that you have with vitanica and they are delicious you know they taste like vanilla or hazelnut <laughs> and it's just so nice so thank you so much for that and of course creating formulas that are effective that's that's the big fun game of it right that's the creative part in my but you're right herbal medicine can kind of be fraught with you know we're specialists in bad tasting medicine unless you <laughs> unless you work at it to make it taste better yeah you give hope that it doesn't have to be that way and I, I'm, <laughs> I'm a firm believer that it doesn't have to be that way either i i did want to ask you a question just definitely not off the list that i i gave you but talking about blackberry and you being a specialist in women's health and red raspberry leaf being such a very popular or for uterine health and and such. One question I get a lot is about blackberry leaf and that if that can be used in similar ways or if the medicinal properties are going to be. Almost... I don't think it translates to a uterine tonic like blackberry does. Do, do you, are you familiar with that? I have never actually yeah. tried blackberry for that. So okay. I was like, oh, I'll ask you. No, <laughs> you I don't, know I don't, we're on I the don't blackberry. think so at all. Um, yeah. But that's not to say, you know, we know everything there is to know. Right, of course. Um, but I was just, let me just look right here, blackberry leaf uh, benefits. I think mostly I think of, and it looks like it's on here, um, just more the, um, the antioxidants mm. in the berries for sure, and right. flavonoids, and therefore impact on immunity. But... Um, I don't know if there's other, looks like maybe a little bit of some uh, sore throat, sore gums, mouth ulcers, Ish. inflammation, diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think there's any translation between raspberry leaves and blackberry leaves for mm -hmm. as a uterine tonic or postpartum or anything. It would be fascinating if somebody later on were like, yes, there is. But, you know, it's it's that whole piece of like, we're still learning about these yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. When I think about blackberry as medicine, I more think about using it as an astringent in cases of 
diarrhea or something yeah, along those lines. Right. So, right. um, cool. I just had to ask. So. Yeah, sure. No problem. <laughs> it's always fun to chat about that stuff. And I, I love also that you brought up Rosemary and you brought up Cascade and, um, Cascade has a very strong influence in my path as an herbalist. And of course, Rosemary does as well. Um, but I think of those ladies of women of your age and your generation. And I just, I love thinking about stories of you guys just playing and talking about herbs and mm -hmm. sharing this wisdom and this knowledge with so many other people. And I know Cascade taught a lot at NUNM as well. Yeah. yeah, she was very influential on my generation of uh naturopathic physicians. She taught that was and she taught lay people, she taught herbalists, she taught naturopathic physicians. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, someone else of course who's been around a long time was Susan Weed. I don't know, I haven't heard of her for a while, so I don't really know if she's still involved in herbal education. Of course Cascade passed away some years ago. Um, but May 4th, 2013. 2013. Yeah. <laughs> I remember very distinctly. Wow, yeah. She, uh, I was pregnant yeah. with my daughter yeah. <laughs> at that oh, time. Wow. Yeah. And I know Rosemary has books that we can still access. And Susan Lee has older books that we can still access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Susan's still out and about. Um, yeah. I love chatting with Rosemary and anybody learning about her. I love chatting with Elliot. Um, Cascade's husband. He's really wonderful. And Cascade actually came to me multiple times right after she passed in my dreams. Mm. And I was not a believer of such things. I was like, oh no, that's hippy dippy woo woo stuff. People don't really do that. And the like right after she passed, she was supposed to come teach at, at the clinical school I was learning at and um, came to me in my dreams and said, you have what it takes. Oh. You have the voice, you have the power to shout it from the mountains and the treetops about the importance of using these plants as medicine. Mm -hmm. You have to go do it. Yeah, it's a body chilling story for me every time that it yeah. comes out. So um, <laughs> one of those very, very special things. And I only took one plant walk with her at Brighton Bush <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> several years before. And somehow I was... That was a good way to learn from her was just those... They call them herb walks. I, I always call them herb stands because there was a lot of standing <laughs> around and, and you know, looking at a plant and talking about it. I love that. I love that. So you also run a clinic around the Portland, yeah. Oregon area, right? Yeah. Um, it's a woman's time, right? Well, the woman's time. Yeah, we're yeah. A, a women's health clinic, which is women's health somehow people sometimes think it's this narrow little area of women's health it's everything anything that can happen in a woman it's is we deal with at our clinic whether that's a gynecological problem a, a bigger endocrinological problem or you know mental health regular stuff like blood pressure and uh, weight management Mm -hmm. arthritis, autoimmune diseases, thyroid, headaches, you, you name it, kind of any, any and all things. Yeah, I love that. And I think what I love about what you do is the integration of Western medicine with things like herbs and other natural healing modalities. And I think this is a really important thing to bring up because as there's a greater and greater rush of people to turn to herbal medicine, I feel like post pandemic, suddenly people are like, oh my gosh, I don't trust Western medicine at all. So I never want to go to a doctor again. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Western that's, medicine that's, can that's save a, lives. That's an unfortunate <laughs> conclusion. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm a believer in uh, we need the whole spectrum of options. And uh, one of the beauties of a, a well-trained modern thinking naturopathic physician would be to be able to navigate that spectrum and understand the, the strengths and weaknesses of doing more than you need to do doing less than you need to do um and just continually trying to find that that sweet spot of what's you know if you have a blood pressure of you know 190 over 100 i'm not going to just start with garlic and hawthorn berry you know and i'm going to be saying hey we we should start on 
this medication and see if we can work our way down to something herbal. On the other hand, if you have a blood pressure of you know, 130, 140, 150 over something, that's that's probably a good zone for herbal medicine. You know, grape seed extract, hawthorn berry, uh, the herbal diuretic, uh, garlic, and of course magnesium, and of course nutrition and exercise and stress. Of course, yeah, all the all so the key. The, the point is that there's yeah, there's a time and a place, I believe, for all of it, and even more likely a time and a place for the the, the blend of things. Yeah, I I agree. It definitely works really well together. And it's just really nice to hear other people speak of that because I see where people may have gained a great amount of distrust in the system. The system's broken, but balance is really important. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind (laughs) of a fan of uh, weeding out fundamentalist, rigid thinking, no matter which which side spectrum <laughs> yes and, uh, and a more balanced collab- collaborative uh uh yeah balance is a good word yeah yeah so i'm curious on one thing i was really fortunate i i did not go to nunm as a nunm student though when i lived in atlanta georgia in the 90s i always flipped through the paper catalog dreaming of it I did get to go to many different herbal events and traditional routes and things like that Mm -hmm. there and connect with a lot of amazing naturopathic students and and doctors. And um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts or feelings on how much herbal medicine is truly integrated into the naturopathic world today because I some naturopaths I speak to are very knowledgeable in herbal medicine and others are not and of course we're going to have our specialties in certain areas. Well there are requirements you know there are base requirements of how much of the curriculum is botanical medicine and there and I don't know exactly what those hours and courses are right now I have a I think it's at least four full term courses, but I'm a little uh, out of touch with what the requirements. But so there are requirements right. of in terms of the didactic education. And then once you get into clinical training, it it there is a lot of variability there based on you know what are who your supervisors are, who your clientele is, what um and who you are and what your priorities are. And I think um, there are uh, lots of stresses and strains on the system such that uh, it's, I think, um, seductive for the the naturopathic profession to sort of do maybe more pharmaceuticals in the more modern era than than we might. Uh, philosophically even prefer but like mm-hmm. i said there's lots of stresses and strains on the system from different avenues mm-hmm. of, about why that is um happening i think and so i think it's up to students and practitioners to kind of be strong on the on the what are your values your beliefs your philosophies that um uh, that you can continue the to keep alive the reason why you wanted to study that medicine to begin with. There's also just the job market. I mean, for a naturopathic physician, um, you know, increasingly there are opportunities to work in very busy primary care clinics where they're medical. They're called medical homes where they have to do business in a certain way. Mm-hmm. You know, a certain amount of time to see the patients, a certain expectations of of the patients, as well as the um, medical model that that clinic is signed on to uh, financially and and uh, regulatory. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, in certain situations, yeah, more and more naturopathic physicians are in settings where pharmaceuticals kind of tend to win the day. Uh, because of efficiency and time and da, 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 and what patients maybe can afford and it's on their insurance plans, et cetera. And but patient person, compliance. like my clinic, I can do anything I want. I'm, I mean, I don't, I'm, <laughs> I'm not, 
you know, uh, beholden, and, and, and I would be an example of, you know, a graduate that could go out and do the same thing, a small clinic or solo or a few friends or a couple or a friend, a colleague and start a business and, and maintain the original sort of intention uh, right. of a, of a priority on natural therapies and mm -hmm integrate pharmaceuticals as that physician is comfortable to do so. Um, it, and so there's incredible variability, individuality, yeah. in being a naturopathic physician, which I think makes it hard on a consumer, like who are they going to? They might not understand ahead of time what is going to happen at that clinic. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think I would encourage uh, consumers and patients to, you know, do a little exploration of what is the mindset and what are the philosophies and, and uh, orientation of that clinic or that naturopathic physician. But yeah, there's pressures on the system for sure yeah. that is evolving our medicine and maybe in ways that we hadn't intended um actually you know it takes time to practice this kind of medicine uh and uh so that's one of the pressures is just financially for example naturopathic physicians are not reimbursed at the same rate as our medical doctors or even nurse practitioners mm -hmm. uh, even though our training exceeds theirs or at least as uh, as much as and so you know i spend an hour i'm only going to get this amount and so then the temptation is well i'm going to change my practice so i only spend 30 minutes or 20 minutes because i'm going to get the same for reimbursement for that as i would for that yeah. uh and so and then students now have these you know quarter million dollars loans to pay off and so that's an example of a lot of pressures on the system and you can see someone with a sore throat and you know here are a few key things about the history, look quickly, quick exam, maybe you take a swab, maybe you don't, prescribe an antibiotic, boom, versus, you know, you have to practice that sore throat in a whole, more a holistic concept, context of their health requires more time, more information. Mm -hmm. um, if you're there putting together your own herbal formula for them, that takes time. Mm -hmm. um, having a few more symptoms, not just, oh, a sore throat, it's uh, and it looks red and, you know, it's an infection given an antibiotic. There's more information that's nuanced that makes you want to use this herb versus that herb. Yeah. So time is, it takes more time. Yeah. And it just, it gets complex. And that fact that the naturopaths are not paid as well as MDs is, is a, a big piece of it, especially with those big yeah. student loans these days. So, um, and yes, insurance and the liabilities. And honestly, I think patient compliance is a big piece there too, because a lot of people don't want to shift their lifestyle and reduce mm -hmm. stress and change their eating habits and, and right. whatnot. At least that's what I come across as an herbalist. Sure. You know, so. But, you know, but uh, yes, absolutely. I agree with you. And that said, I think it's important for, the general public to realize you could go to a naturopathic physician and get an herbal treatment for the problem at hand and not have to do all those things. I mean, right. you don't have to change your diet. You don't have to do this, this, that, and that. You might have to hear about it, but, but, <laughs> but you can still, you know, you can still be, I can, I can still treat you. You know, right. I can still treat your blood pressure or your sore throat or your chronic cough or your abdominal pain or your diarrhea or whatever it is. Um, and yes, I'm going to share with you some of the influences of some of these lifestyle factors and how food can be medicinal for you, but I can still uh, treat you without those changes being made. And there sometimes it's more of an obstacle. You know, if you're, you know, got, high cholesterol for example um you know continuing to eat burgers and fries and things is going to make it a more challenging process to improve your cardiovascular health with just herbal medicine there's 
um, we're missing out on, you know, the opportunity to do other things that, that matter. And that that's that's can be said for many, if not most health issues. Absolutely. But I don't want people to think steer clear of me or another naturopathic physician because they're afraid to think they, they're thinking I'm gonna tell them they need to stop drinking their coffee, which I'm never gonna do. Because <laughs> uh, that has a medicinal benefit. I was just too. gonna yeah. say there's plenty of great medicine in coffee, thank yeah, you. Yeah, right, <laughs> yeah, right. But you know, there's there's a moderation and involved. Yeah, absolutely. Um Fantastic perspectives on there. And yes, we can definitely help people with acute symptoms and plant medicine in so many different ways. Um, I'm really curious, just a kind of question out of the blue, since you have been practicing as a woman's healthcare practitioner for almost my entire life. Have you <laughs> noticed a shift in the most common complaints from women in your earlier years to women today. Hey, I wanted to take a quick pause to show some love and gratitude to our sponsors of the Herbalist Path podcast, who make this show possible for me and possible for you too. So here it goes. I love this time of year. It's spring, the sun is shining, and all of our beautiful plant friends are popping up. It's amazing. Unless, of course, you're one of the millions of people who suffer from seasonal allergies. You know, the itchy, watery eyes, the sneezing and wheezing that's straight miserable. Thankfully, there are some amazing herbs that can help you with all of that, just like the herbs inside of Kick-Ask Allergy from Wish Garden Herbs, one of my absolute favorite herbal companies out there. Kick-Ask Allergy, yes, I said ask without the K at the end. Anyways, this formula has yerba santa, nettles, echinacea for that immune support, and orange peels all which come together to help dry up those excessive mucosal secretions. Yep, I'm talking about the sniffles and the stuffy nose, the watery eyes and all that jazz. This blend also acts as a great expectorant and can help ease the swelling and inflammation in those mucosal tissues. It is a top go-to for seasonal allergies. And get this, they combine all those beautiful herbs with glycerin, so it actually tastes pretty darn good. Or should I say, it tastes kick-ass, without the K at the end. <laughs> Anyways, if allergy season is miserable for you, and you want a natural remedy that actually works for those itchy eyes and being all sneezy and wheezy, you have got to check out Wish Garden Herbs Kick-Ask Allergy. And for those of you with the little kiddos, no sweat, they've got a kick it allergy too. And you pregnant mamas, you don't have to suffer either. They've got a kick ass allergy formula just for you. So head over to wishgardenherbs.com or check out the link in the show notes and go grab yourself some kick ass allergy so you can enjoy spring again. <laughs> And it's okay if you so don't have I would answer. say the most common complaints, I don't know that I've seen a shift. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's still, you know, menstrual cramps, vaginal infections, PMS, headaches, fatigue, constipation, you know, all that stuff. But I would say there is a shift, I think, in more complex conditions. And mm -hmm. there's more and more patients on my docket that, you know, have much more complex chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, fibromyalgia, autoimmune diseases that maybe we can't even quite figure out what it is just yet, or mm -hmm. uh, multiple chemical sensitivities, or uh, uh, hypersensitivity syndromes, or, you know, chronic pain syndromes that might not have a name most of the time they do but sometimes they don't 
mm-hmm. patient the other day, very compl- very unusual presentation of, of uh, neuropathy or neurological symptoms that didn't fit any easy pattern at all and no easy test to do. And I thought she had something called small fiber neuropathy, which that's complex with no specific cure. Um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, just like these more complex things, harder, more paint, more cumbersome, more challenging to live a life of a patient with one of these conditions. Uh, mm-hmm. That I that seems that is what I've noticed. Yeah, and it it seems to me like your role as the physician is also as the detective, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. how do we figure this out? And when somebody is coming to you presenting with multiple issues, yeah. which I would imagine is quite common, like getting to the, like, how do you help them? Like, do you first help with just easing the mind and the stress of those symptoms? And I would imagine it's variable per person, yeah. but. Um, well, the first step is, is what, do we understand your illness and is there important evaluation assessment to come to a precise diagnosis? And I'm a big fan of that. And I think that is sometimes uh, a shortcoming of natural medicine or uh, is that, you know, oh, you have irregular periods. Let's just give you chase, chase berry. And no, we need to know why, because there's some simple causes. There's some complex, there's even some, unfortunate causes yeah. uh even uh you know serious causes so uh, to me i'm a big fan of knowing w- trying to understand and come to a diagnosis because the treatment matters yeah. you know the herb matters the vitamin matters the medicine whatever it is matters i can help you a lot quicker and a lot better most of the time if i know what exactly we are really treating and understanding the disease process and the mechanisms that are underpinning that disease process. I wish I could get that on megaphone and have it much louder <laughs> for the people in the back. I mean, I, 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 so obviously I'm of a g- different generation and I'm entirely too in tune with what's happening on social media. And so often I just get messages of, I have X, Y, Z problem. What's the herb I can take? And I'm just like, I can't give you healthcare advice on social media. Like I would, you know, I just uh, helping the masses understand that yeah. herbs aren't necessarily your instant fix pill that you're looking for and that you are a complex being. And because Vitex worked for your sister or your mother it does not necessarily mean it is going to be the That's herb right. for you right That's now. Right. So... And the same things, there's a, there's a big swing now back to, you know, menopausal hormones can solve all, all your ills. Uh, yeah. And that's not true either. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, it's a lot safer than people came to believe the last 20 years. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's the reason why you're overweight or fatigued or not sleeping just because you're 51 years old. You know, mm-hmm. there's... We still have to kind of go through the vetting process of understanding all that person's symptoms and what fatigue is always a good example. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of, I think one of the kind of knee jerk reactions of, of more of a natural medicine mindset on someone who's chronically fatigued is, oh, you have gluten sensitivity or, (laughs) oh, you, um, or what would be another thought? Um, Oh, you have adrenal fatigue well maybe but but there's a lot more common things that we got and boxes we can check and things that we can easily test what you could just have an iron deficiency you know simple easy peasy to test easy peasy to treat uh you could have a thigh uh, be hypothyroid easy to test easy to treat um so fatigue is a good one because there's you know there's these simple causes and there's then there's sort of elephants in the room causes like well maybe you're not sleeping enough or you know maybe you're not sleeping well enough uh and then yeah we get into some medium uh, complex things like 
like adrenal, but or more complex like Epstein Barr or uh you know more complex like you know other blood disorders but it's just a simple a, a simple symptom like fatigue uh needs to be a, a methodical process of understanding why mm -hmm. and treating the why uh, right. is i think the most efficient most effective safest way to go but there are certainly things, as you know, Mel, just that, uh, that, that I mean, I don't I want to I don't want to sidestep the possibility of self-help, you know, and the immense right. things that one can do uh, that's that's a self-help with whether that's a, a diet change or an herbal thing. But I don't mm -hmm. want to underestimate that, you know, things. But there's things that lend themselves to that. Oh, I have menstrual cramps every month you've had menstrual cramps every month for years you know they're not getting worse over time okay try some cramp bark you know mm -hmm. try some uh magnesium and there's a lot of things on that list that that lends itself to to self-help and simple yeah. things to try absolutely and you have great supplements to help those people that need it too through vitanica which yeah, is i hope so I, we try really really it's wonderful awesome. yeah. um I'm curious, because I am 45 and apparently entering my perimenopausal years, what words of wisdom do you have for women entering this phase of life in general? What yeah. can we do to ensure that our menopausal and perimenopausal years are as fabulous as can be? <laughs> um, well, I think the first step is probably just understanding this is a normal process you know it's mm -hmm. it's something you can't really abort um you it's a normal process and some people suffer more than others and so some people never have a hot flash i i for example never had one uh and you know other people have no symptoms minimal symptoms severe symptoms lots of symptoms everybody's going to have if they go through menopause naturally everybody's going to have a change in their menstrual cycle mm -hmm. boom that's the thing that will everybody will have so sometimes that's fairly uneventful change and sometimes it's a chaotic change mm -hmm. so i think but just understanding that there are changes that are going to happen and reading about re getting informed I have a new book called The Menopause Companion. That's one one way just to get informed about what this is all about. But there's a lot of menopause books on the market. Not all of them would I vote for, but um, the book I would vote for, dialing in the benefits and risk of hormones, is a book called Estrogen Matters. Um, that's a great summary, a factual summary of of the research on the benefits and risks of menopausal hormone therapy. But back to your question. Um, yeah, I think getting under, realizing this is a normal process, mm -hmm. getting informed, and then understanding when do I need to do something? What are some yellow flags and some red flags? And most of the symptoms, you, you know, it's a matter of sort of, if we're having mild symptoms, it's a matter of sort of adapting to and you know i'm yeah i'm hotter but it's not a big deal yeah i'm not sleeping quite as soundly but it's not a big deal versus i am not falling it's taking me 2 hours to fall asleep and i'm waking up 3 times a night and i'm awake one hour each time now that's a problem it's going to affect your cognition and your energy and your mood so there's degrees of bothersomeness and degrees of severity and degrees of how much it impacts one's life. Um, and that's true whether it's hot flashes or sleep or mood or libido or vaginal dryness or skin dryness or eye dryness or hair thinning. It's all a matter of how much is it uh, bothering you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there, so that's sort of the, the quality of life bucket. And then there's understanding and getting informed and probably going to a menopause informed practitioner what are what are the diseases of aging that i in particular am at risk for now that my estrogen is dropping and is postmenopausal now what is my risk well my mother had 
uh, osteoporosis and a hip fracture. I need to be doing something about that now. Um, my mother or father or sibling had a, you know, a, a heart attack or a cardiac event in their 50s. Okay, I'm, I got some risk factors there. I have a, a parent or a sibling that has Alzheimer's disease. I have a risk factor there. Mm -hmm. Breast cancer in the immediate family. I have a risk factor there. Those are just some the kind of the, the highlighted four, I would say, mm -hmm. of bones, brain, heart, and breast. Uh, mm -hmm. to understand what are my risk factors. Some of them are, are subjective and some of them are objective. We can do some tests and things and determine what's your risk of heart disease for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, so knowing that we can identify risks and do risk reduction strategies with herbs, with medicines, with lifestyle changes. And then mm -hmm. there's perhaps diseases that we have had a little bit maybe we've had a little bit of osteoarthritis in our knees well now it's you know it could easily now get worse mm -hmm. uh maybe we've had a little bit of weight gain now it could easily start to get more escalated you know in our 50s because of change in that hormonal status so maybe we have had a little high blood pressure now it's you know changing for the worse so there's sort of these three buckets quality of life issues, disease prevention, disease treatment. And those are the, that's a kind of a mini summary of how to frame and how to think about entering perimenopause and menopause. Some of it is specifically related to change in hormones and some of it is uh, just aging, age related. And some of it is the two wrapped together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious when you were speaking initially about like some people are going to have a lot of symptoms, some people are not. Do you see any correlation between those that tend to suffer more symptoms and, and lifestyle choices maybe to those that, that don't? I would say symptom wise, menopause symptom wise, um, a little bit, maybe, mm -hmm. but like if you're, um, it may be that, um, I mean, stress, for example, can be a, uh, make you more, uh, vulnerable to hot flashes and night sweats and insomnia, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are, yeah, there are, there are some things like that, but, um, but a lot of it is just, it's, there's some hereditary aspects. There's some genetic aspects. There's some we don't know aspects. There's some some you won the lottery. There's some, I've I've kind of been. I, I had a woman today. She said I've always I'm I'm overweight. It's I've gained more weight in the last. She was in her late forties, I think. Uh, more you know twenty pounds this last couple of years. She says, I always, always been able to just change my diet and start, you know, they bring more attention to my diet and exercise and lose those 20 pounds, you know, inside of the, inside of six to 12 months. That's not happening anymore. She said, I can't, that's not working anymore. And there are physiological explanations for that. In your late forties, the metabolism slows down, insulin resistance increases, uh, loss of muscle mass are sort of this perfect storm of things, some of which are related to aging and some of which are related to dropping of estrogen and or testosterone. Um, so um, there, there, are, there are some things that are just random. There's no reason, that I, I, there's no spe special reason why I never had hot flashes and night sweats. Mm -hmm. But for someone else, if they are, super stressed person that now they have severe hot flashes, there might be a little correlation there, but it's not black and white. Gotcha. Okay. Um, thank you for all of that. Yeah. <laughs> it's always fun to listen to, even if I guess thinking about menopausal and perimenopausal symptoms isn't really fun, but so far <laughs> I, I, I'm like you and have hit the lottery and have not really yeah. dealt with it. I just hear that at my age, I'm supposed to be there. <laughs> I'm like, well, the good news about okay. <laughs> menopause and menopause symptoms, if you're having them, is there are solutions to all of them, really. Uh, right. I'm not saying 
herb necessarily will mm -hmm. herbs work for all symptoms for all women absolutely not uh probably the toughest uh menopause symptom is low libido is 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 change in sexual function in the in that particular realm of low libido mm -hmm. and that again yeah you're 50 and you're having low libido but is that the reason maybe your relationship maybe your stress maybe it's painful maybe you know there's maybe you're taking a medication that's influencing it maybe you're tired mm -hmm. but let's say we weed those things out and it's down to hormonal changes that is that is a symptom that is difficult to get really satisfactory solutions with herbs i would say and hormones maybe we have a better shot but not an absolute shot right, right. <laughs> at that and and sexual function is um, is you know is multifactorial like i said but even when it's just hormonal um it's there's not it's not a slam dunk solution for sure but if mm -hmm. it's involving vaginal dryness and discomfort with sexual activity and that's causing your low libido that's easy to fix i love that there's certain right. things i love to see i love that i know i can help them right away i love it when i have a young woman on my schedule says pms okay great simple <laughs> you know simple i mean there are severe cases of pms no doubt right. but um but there are some things that are sort of a, a relief to see sometimes, you know, like yeah. <laughs> that I, you know, can feel really optimistic that something au natural can really, really help them. And there's yeah. a lot on that list. Even migraines are on that list. And oh, I mean, yeah. there's many things on that list. Depression, mild to moderate depression, I think is a, I feel very optimistic helping women herbally with that mild to moderate anxiety syndrome, same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think chronic insomnia and low libido due to hormonal changes, those are toughies. Yeah. I mean, that has such a dire impact on a relationship. It has an impact on your brain function with no yeah. sleep and, you know, which turns into work and, and right. creates more stress and, you know, the ever evolving cycle. Okay. Um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Yeah, we kind of used our time up, it seems. <laughs> and, we, and we didn't even get to most of your actual herbal questions. But We rarely do, but I am going to get well, at least one more okay. out here. Um, if there were an herb, and obviously we know that this is never everybody, but an <laughs> herb that you would love to give to the majority of women out on this planet yeah of ours what would it be yeah i i think it would probably be turmeric mm, nice because uh, i and i say that because it has such it targets so many it has so many molecular targets and so many pathways physiological pathways of influence mm -hmm. and there is a considerable body of research in many different areas, uh, even one study on hot flashes, a study on PMS, but but we get into more studies on you know osteoarthritis and uh, even some roles in oncology and cancer, uh, insulin resistance, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, pre-diabetes. I mean the the, the list is long, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you can take turmeric with most medications, not absolutely all, but um, yeah, it's, if I were, you know, on the island with one herb, that that would probably, I feel like, okay, I can cover a lot of territory with, with this herb. Yeah, I <laughs> love that. You? Do, you, do you have one? Oh, gosh. When I think of it initially, like nettles comes to me just because it's so nourishing and pretty darn safe across the board, unless we are extremely dry and brittle and at that point in life. But nettles comes up really, really yeah. quickly for me there. Yeah. I do have a question on turmeric, though, and I have not read this article, but Tanya Neubauer, I presume you know her. She also went to NUNM. She's Paul Bergner's previous wife. Oh, yeah. 
another naturopathic physician, she just posted, I think I saw it last night and I didn't read it, but I saw the headline, like, is black pepper really necessary with turmeric? And I wish I read the article so I could have a more thorough question, but I guess I'll rephrase the question based upon that article. The best ways for people to consume turmeric without having to go for the fancy, just curcumin supplements. Well, I mean, you know, uh, uh, that I think <laughs> that is a plant that is has hurdles for bioavailability mm -hmm. in the gut. And obviously there's some value if you just use turmeric in your in your kitchen. Uh, people and cultures have been using that, you know, for generations and centuries. So again, I don't want to dismiss that value, but if if I'm trying to uh, treat someone's moderate arthritis of their knee that's really causing them daily pain, I I think we need to take advantage of the modern technology that enhances the absorption, enhances the bioavailability of the curcuminoids in that plant. And black pepper is the sort of like old first generation methodology of enhancing that bioavailability. And we have about seven more generations of methodology to have it be considerably more bioavailable with each new technology that they utilize. And, and I believe that research and have witnessed that in my clinic and, you know, people say, well, I've had it. I mentioned turmeric and they say, well, I've put turmeric in my smoothie. Well, that's really the minimal delivery of the curcuminoids and the effects that it can bring about versus one of these other methodologies that enhances the bioavailability. The bioavailability. Sometimes that's, uh, I don't know that I need to name them all, but black pepper is sort of the rudimentary. And mm -hmm. then there's, um attaching it to a a, a, a fat soluble substance then there's attaching it to a curcumin essential oil and then there's these nanoparticle technologies and then there's this fancy uh what do they call it uh uh somehow some kind of water some kind of fractionation yada yada that they do but the, the, all, the goal for all of them is to enhance the bioavailability. And I do think that matters. So I don't know that what she is, I don't know what she is saying, but if she's saying it doesn't matter and you just can use turmeric powder, I, I wouldn't be able to agree with that. It wasn't her article by any means. And I just read the headline. Of it. So <laughs> I, I did not like actually thoroughly read it. It was late at night and I was like, interesting yeah. i'll have to look at that later so well, feel free to feel free to send it to me but yeah um, cool i know that you also over at vitanica have a fantastic turmeric tonic in the tasty tonics line well, and you've got those ccdg blend yes can um, you talk a little bit about the ccdg blend because i think that is probably the most unique to anybody listening right now um, so that that is a product uh that is used in uh hpv protocols of the cervix and abnormal pap smears and abnormal cell changes of the cervix but it shouldn't be presumed that oh i have an abnormal pap smear i can just take that product of course but, uh because there's um, you know, one, depending on the abnormality of the pap smear, one might need a biopsy. And uh, again, what, what it really is going on is important. But CCDG with the curcumin, the dim, the green tea, and the turkey tail, each one of those things on their own has a little research relevant to HPV or what's called cervical dysplasia. And so that's why they're together. And, and they are, that, that formula is used best in context of I might also need to give a high dose of folate mm -hmm. as part of the protocol. I might also need to give additional turkey tail to the protocol. Mm -hmm. I might also need to use suppositories that have to be made by a special pharmacist. 
Mm -hmm. Or I might need to say, yeah, you do need a LEAP procedure and we'll spend the next year after the LEAP doing CCDG blend to optimize the chance that you don't, that the HPV gets cleared, the human papillomavirus, and it doesn't recur. So it's, it's used in context. But for people who've been told, oh, your pap smear is abnormal, but it's not abnormal enough that you need to do anything else now, just come back in a year and be sure we check it. If you've been told that by your gynecologist, that's a good situation for CCDG blend because they didn't recommend that you needed a biopsy and they're going to do nothing uh, for the next year because there is a high chance that, that the body does clear the virus in many situations. So if you've been told that, then CCDG blend at three a day is a good thing to do during that year to increase the chances of clearing the virus. Nice. I love, uh, thank you for that breakdown. Yeah. I would not have known that that's what you used it for specifically. Yeah. I was just like, oh, a dim and green tea and turmeric and turkey tail. I love them all. So this <laughs> sounds great. Um, so yeah, then I would definitely also say for people wanting to get a really high quality turmeric, your turmeric tonic is... Well, I mean, yes, it's high quality, but I want I do have to say, I mean, the, the source of the plant is high quality, but I'm just looking at the, the book, the page here that Yeah, you have a lot of formulas to example, remember. <laughs> that's an example of sort of first generation methodology of enhancing bioavailability because it is with the black pepper fruit extract. Mm -hmm. So we're not just sticking turmeric root in in a, an extraction process. We are trying to improve the bioavailability, but it is uh, not one of these super fancier, uh, newer technologies, but it is, uh, it's sort of, but it does enhance the bioavailability by putting it with the black pepper. Mm -hmm. But some people need a, a higher delivery of the curcuminoids. Yeah. But thanks for promoting it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I love your product line. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And I wish more people knew about it. You know, I know, I think for quite a long time, you only were for practitioners. Is that correct? Uh, no, we've always kind of done both. We've always okay. had the retail and general public and and the, profession, the practitioner line. Cool. Cool. Well, I will definitely make sure that people are getting a link to Vitanica and to everything we talked about today. Hey. You're the first person I've had on the show that has said turmeric would be like the thing for people. So <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, you're Tori. welcome, Mel. Well, I mean, kudos to you for educating the public, educating women, educating mothers and trying to bring plant medicine into the home as a self-help tool um that I, I appreciate that about you and, and thank you for paving the path for me very good, very good work <laughs> thank All you right. thank you so much and is there anything else you'd like to say to people that are listening ways they can get in touch with you i know we did talk about those quarterly seminars you're doing yeah, that's, um, for, that's for practitioners okay um and other i mean I do have a blog, Dr. Tori Hudson uh, mm -hmm. is a blog. So I post things on there twice a month, most often. Uh, they're hopefully easy read type things, but chock full of science. Uh, oh, yes. Although sometimes I sort of wax a little bit philosophical. Well, um, yeah, but <laughs> we got to bring human in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's an easy, an easy thing to access about information that I can share. Uh, the Menopause Companion new book, the Encyclopedia of Women's Health book yeah. that you mentioned. Um, for, for the general public, those are the best things. Great. Yeah, I will definitely have all of those linked in the show notes. No doubt about it. And again, thank you so much. It's, all right. it's been welcome. an honor. All right. Take care. <laughs> have a great day, Tori. Bye. Yeah. Thank you so much for tuning into another episode of The Herbalist Path. Being on this journey with you is absolutely incredible. If you dig this episode, please leave me a review on your favorite podcast player and share it with your friends. 
so that together we can make herbalism. Hashtag spread like wildflowers. On another note, I must mention that while I know you're getting some good info here, it's important to remember that this podcast is purely for entertainment and educational purposes and is not intended to be a substitute for medical treatment. While the information in this podcast is absolutely relevant, herbs work differently for each person and each condition. That's why I recommend you work with a qualified practitioner, whether that be another herbalist, a naturopath, or your doctor. So thank you again. I am truly Truly honored that you're tuning into these episodes and on the path with me to make sure that there's an herbalist in every home again. Don't forget to share this episode with your friends so that we can make herbalism. Hashtag spread like wildflowers. I wanted to take a quick pause to show some love and gratitude to our sponsors of the Herbalist Path podcast who make this show possible for me and possible for you too. So here it goes. Medicinal mushrooms are all the rage these days, if you didn't know already. And with great reason, because they are powerful medicine that can improve your health and your life in so many different ways when they're well-made. Yeah, it's true. There's a lot of stuff on the market that isn't going to be so effective. And that's why you need to find a brand that you can actually trust. For me, that brand is Whole Sun Wellness. And this is the creation of a brilliant woman and fellow mama, Jamie Bonfiglio. She's an international mushroom educator that has been working in the medicinal mushroom industry for years. And this is when she saw firsthand how many other companies take shortcuts when it comes to their products. And Jamie wasn't having it. She set out to build her company the right way. Whole Sun Wellness is here to raise the industry standards so those crap mushrooms on the market aren't getting into your body or your family's body. Whole Sun Wellness is the first company to test and report nutritional facts for all of their extracts. They go beyond industry standards every step of the way, from sourcing to extraction and final testing. And as the owners of the largest medicinal mushroom farm in the United States, Whole Sun Wellness is taking control of their supply chain for the highest quality and absolute full transparency. They're even the first company to include pure mycelium extract in every single product. So when you're thinking of getting medicinal mushrooms for you and your family, Whole Sun Wellness is exactly the ones you want. Also, be sure to check out their new Mycolites. These are the world's first dissolvable electrolyte tablets. They're featuring functional mushroom extracts that'll give you more energy, more stamina, and recovery as well. And who couldn't use all of that? The other thing is, they are these adorable little mushroom-shaped tablets, and they come in like a little Altoids box, but way cooler than Altoids, because they're mycolites. Anyways, head to wholesunwellness.com to grab yourself some mycolites and all of the other functional medicinal mushrooms that you and your family need. And of course, you can grab that link right here in the show notes now. 